This is World Report. Now from Western Alaska, here's Tom Bearden. For most Americans, global warming isn't much more than a series of headlines in a newspaper. But for several thousand native Alaskans, global warming is a very real crisis right now. Land is getting narrower, our village and other places around it because of this uh, global warming. Our winters are later and our summers are earlier and hotter the last few years, especially since 2004. They believe the changing climate is destroying the very ground that many coastal communities were built on and it threatens to destroy their subsistence way of life. When Perry and John Weawana go hunting, they travel several miles across snow-packed ice looking for bearded seals that swim in the Chukchi Sea. Okay, right here, good spot, huh? Oh yeah, good. Yeah. The two cousins are Inupiat Eskimos who live in the village of Shishmaref on a barrier island just 20 miles south of the Arctic Circle. There must be a younger ice behind us, huh? Because we're on the other side of this ridge. Mm -hmm. And then there were seals very close. Although they use modern snowmobiles, or snow machines as they're called up here, the villagers are continuing their traditional way of life. Our main food is the bearded seal, and walrus, and other seals. Right after the bearded seal is taken care of, then the salmon come. And then right after that, the salmon, and then a few weeks later, then the berries are ready. And then everybody goes through a different stage of activity, but it's still hands-on. Now that cycle is changing. The sea ice has been melting earlier in the spring and forming later in the fall. The level of the sea is also rising. That means higher waves during fall storms. In the past, sea ice has served as a barricade to protect the shoreline. But without it, the storm surge has undercut the ground beneath structures close to the water's edge. All of this has dramatically increased the chance that a storm could submerge the entire island. In a storm surge, if the water gets high enough, they would be inundated. Trish Ophine is Chief of Engineering for the Alaska District of the Army Corps of Engineers. During those types of events, there really is no, very little um, evacuation assistance that can be provided because you're dealing with rough seas. To go by water, you're typically in the midst of a storm, so providing air assistance is extremely difficult. The Corps is the main federal agency for dealing with coastal erosion in Alaska. It's identified 11 other native villages in addition to Shishmaref, which it says are at immediate risk of being damaged or destroyed because of climate change. And it says 180 villages will be affected to some degree by warming temperatures. The Corps has already begun some short-term projects to protect at-risk communities. In Shishmaref, it's in the midst of building a 150-foot-long rock barrier. But there's a general consensus that these sorts of measures will merely delay the inevitable, that eventually this entire village will have to move to higher ground. And then the question becomes, who's going to pay for it? I think most of us have the same conclusion here, is, and that we, we're not going to beat Mother Nature. I mean, <laughs> Percy Nyokpuk is one of the elders in Shishmaref. He owns one of the island's two grocery stores. Residents here voted six years ago to move the village to safer ground on the mainland just a few miles away. But such a move will be expensive. Estimates run as high as two to three hundred million dollars for each village. And Nyokpuk thinks the federal government should pick up much of that tab. Nyokpuk says for 400 years his people lived in smaller, more nomadic communities which could easily pick up and move. Right, story number one. But in the 1920s, the federal government mandated that all native children must get a formal education. So it built a central school on the island, effectively ending the nomadic way of life. They very easily could have built it on the mainland, and everybody would have been on the mainland. Chishmarep is here mainly because the government insisted we move here. Now, I think they should be also... Uh, they should also remember that and, and, and maybe also give us a hand with the move. We, we certainly can do it ourselves. The median family income in Shishmaref is $30,000 a year, and virtually every household on the island receives some sort of government assistance. It's hard to imagine why rebuilding a village like this in another location would be so expensive. After all, the roads here aren't paved, and the homes have no indoor plumbing. Instead, they use what are euphemistically called honey buckets. 
But the Corps' Ophine says if the federal or state government is involved, it means following strict rules and regulations for housing and infrastructure, all of which is costly. New construction also means transporting building materials a great distance and bringing in workers. You've got a crew of 25, 30 people. You have to bring everything in to house that crew for construction, including their, the housing literally as well as all of the food, um, the transportation and the hauling to get these uh, folks to those locations is extremely expensive and we're moving to a location typically if they do relocate that doesn't have a road service to it so even building the road service up to the new community has a, an expense associated with it. One native village isn't waiting for the federal or state governments to act. 370 miles south of Shishmaref, villagers in Newtok acquired land and found grant money to build houses at a new location. Their current village is rapidly sinking because of melting permafrost. In fact, during summer months, many of their boardwalks are completely submerged. And while they ultimately will need state and federal money to build major projects like a barge landing and an airport, state officials applaud New Talk for what it's doing. Larry Hartig admits the government has been slow to come to the aid of native people. We're very proud of the people in New Talk and they, they're doing a great job out there and in helping themselves and that's what each of the community needs to do, it's what the state needs to do, we all need to step up to the plate here and New Talk's done that. Hartig heads up a new committee appointed by the governor to develop a long-range plan to deal with the financial and cultural effects of climate change. But the residents of the village of Kibalina, about a hundred miles north of Shishmaref, are skeptical the government will actually provide the kind of money that's necessary. Their village has been battered by violent storms, like this one four years ago, and each storm takes with it a chunk of their land. They've decided to try a novel approach at funding their move. Earlier this year, they filed a lawsuit against oil and gas companies for causing climate change. Heather Kendall Miller is one of their attorneys. The basis of, of the lawsuit is attempting to find a way of bringing a tort case against the greatest carbon emitters um, to hold them responsible for the changes that are taking place on our globe, on our planet. And these changes are being felt the most by people who have contributed the least amount of carbon. Those happen to be uh, native communities that living in the Arctic. And every time we have big storm, it's falling real bad. Kendall Miller and her clients from Kivalina are patterning the suit after the big tobacco lawsuits from the 1990s, charging the companies with public nuisance and conspiracy to knowingly mislead the public about global warming. Kendall Miller says she knows the suit is a long shot, but says it's a last-ditch effort. There is a role for government here, and there is a role for the courts, and there is a role for big business to each come forward and contribute to what the costs of climate change are. And those costs are very, very high right now um, because we are at the uh, edge of a cliff and we're about to fall over unless each of us assumes some responsibility uh, for dealing with the, uh, the magnitude of these changes. If enough money can't be found, either from big business or the state or federal governments to relocate the 12 villages, there's been talk of just dispersing residents to larger communities like Nome, or even Anchorage. But all of the villagers we talked to said that wasn't an option. Lucy Adams and her son Enoch live in Kivalina. We're always standing alone as little native people of Kivalina. Nobody don't want to help us. Finally, they start getting our attention, but we will not be split apart to other villages. That's one thing they got to know. We have to live as community, not splitting families to other villages. Would you move into a, a total stranger's home? You wouldn't do that for, to live there for the rest of your life. That's how we feel. Um, To ask us to do something like that is um, basically that's what you would be asking us to do, move into somebody else's home. For Enoch, Lucy and thousands of other native Alaskans, it is a very modern problem threatening an ancient way of life. They're hoping today's government and legal system will help to turn the tide.